All right, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, it's a pleasure today to welcome Christian Olson for part two of our uh, Genius series to talk about um, Genius. Uh, this is going to be Genius R7. So R8 is uh, currently in beta, is that right, Christian? Yes, that's correct. It's, uh, it's coming out October 8th, thereabouts, I believe. Okay, so we've got a week. So, yeah. so we're currently on uh, R7. So for SB Grid and licensing, if you download R8, uh, it's not going to be compatible with the license yet, but we're going to work on that. So, um, but for now, we'll just stick with uh, R7 and talk about some of those features. So, uh, thanks, Christian. Whenever you're ready. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much, and uh, thank you everyone for coming. Uh, thanks for giving me the opportunity to speak about Genius. Um, so, as Jason mentioned, my name is Christian Olson. I'm the application scientist for Biomatters, and I've been with Biomatters now for a couple of years. And uh, before this, I worked at uh, Seattle Biomed in a bioinformatics core. And our main purpose was to uh, help the PIs of the Institute uh, analyze, uh, curate, manage, uh, build experiments. Um, so I'm coming at this uh, from, from quite a, a heavy user point of view and um, you know, pretty much aimed at the infectious disease research space. And uh, within the bioinformatics space, uh, you probably know there are a lot of issues, and I'll be touching upon some of those. There are a few standard entry-level slides that um, I always go through because I'm not sure who's in the audience, and it's a good idea just to let everybody know where we are coming from uh, with our software. And if you've done any amount of uh, sequence analysis, you know that there are a number of problems uh, that are inherent in, with sequence analysis. Uh, there's a lot of confusion out there in terms of which programs uh, to use. Um, the, the abundance of programs uh, really doesn't help this. Uh, oftentimes, you'll have to utilize a number of different programs uh, as well as web services in order to carry out your pipeline. And as such, when these programs are, are built, when these uh, software uh, applications are designed, uh, oftentimes there can be an interoperability issue uh, where the importing and the exporting of data uh, the sharing, collaboration uh, is really affected because oftentimes file formats uh, are a, a big deal um, to, or a big hurdle to get around. You have to worry about file format conversion. And there's also quite a steep learning curve. <clears throat> Users find many applications quite difficult to understand, um, not because they can't understand them, but because the volume of the applications out there is just is, is too many. And uh, time that is uh, really valuable in the lab or writing grants or presenting material, uh, that has to uh, give way to learning how to operate uh, software, which, as we all know, can, can take quite a bit of time out of the day. And so the solution uh, that we see it uh, is if you're able to combine existing applications into one framework, meaning you don't have six or seven windows open up on your desktop, and you're having to remember which window is open, you're having to bounce around from one to the other, uh, that, that really uh, is, is, is a major feature for Genius, uh, that uh, you can have everything underneath one user interface. We also designed Genius uh, to be extensible. And we did this uh, because we're very well aware that uh, bioinformatics uh, changes uh, quite rapidly. So we've offered a public API uh, so that people who are uh, uh, familiar with uh, programming in Java, uh, they can take what we've built and they can extend it. So if there's a new assembler or a new method that is out there uh, and it's a file type that Genius already works with, uh, we work with over 60 different file types, uh, then you can easily uh, build on, on what we've done. And we can help you do that too. And we've also uh, designed Genius by uh, consulting and collaboration uh, with scientists, uh, people who are in the field, uh, in the lab, uh, doing the work. Uh, I think the majority of our, compa or of our company um, in New Zealand uh, are PhDs. So we've all uh, defended, we've all had experiments crash, uh, and we all have tacit knowledge that we can uh, infuse into the software. Okay, And so when we collaborate with our users at, at Harvard or, or wherever, that feedback is quite valuable because it really helps us to refine uh, and to improve uh, what we offer for the broader research community. So Genius is a cross-platform uh, Java application. 
Uh, for those of you who have not seen Genius yet, uh, you can uh, download a copy and install it uh, onto whatever machine you have, whether it's a PC or Mac or Linux. That shouldn't be the issue for you. Uh, you should not have to worry about what operating system you have. Uh, and indeed, that's the case. So you just install Genius onto your laptop uh, or onto your uh, desktop. Um, we modeled it on an email client interface uh, because uh, everyone knows how to manage their data uh, within their email. Uh, you create files and folders and rename and color, and you can really organize and structure your data uh, the way that you like. Uh, and I mentioned this a little bit ago. Um, we integrate uh, industry-leading uh, bioinformatics tools, uh, peer-reviewed algorithms. And I believe this is uh, one of the fundamental uh, uh, pieces uh, within Genius that really uh, stands out, is that the algorithms and the methods that are used within Genius uh, have been heavily published. Uh, they're peer-reviewed, uh, they're trusted, uh, they're not proprietary. And because they're not proprietary, uh, we support these uh, open file formats that I had mentioned. Up to 60, actually a little over 60 now, um, we have a drag and drop interface. So if you don't know what type of file you have, you can simply drag it and drop it into Genius. And we've also organized Genius into complete workflows. So while the analysis of the data uh, is, is critical, uh, what happens if you have to go through a data discovery period? Well, we've, we've given you tools uh, to do that. Uh, and then once you've had data, uh, once you analyze your data, uh, now you need to share your data. You need to publish it uh, in terms of a figure or perhaps another file. You have to create a, a chart or a graph. Uh, we've, we've given, I think, quite uh, powerful tools uh, for this too. So we, we focus on the whole continuum, okay? And, and the thrust of genius is not to uh, replace bioinformaticians. Uh, the thrust of genius is to get uh, more and more biologists working on their sequence data so that bioinformaticians can be freed up to work on harder issues, okay? So I think it's very naive uh, to build uh, a, a piece of software that would attempt to replace bioinformaticians. So just keep that in mind, okay? We, we're looking to empower biologists. And Genius covers a number of technical features. Uh, it offers many different helps uh, in many different domains. And uh, certainly, I won't be speaking about all of these today. Uh, today, I'll be speaking mostly about the cloning functionality, uh, as well as some chromatogram editing and assembly, uh, some multiple sequence alignments. Uh, people are always asking about pairwise or multiple alignments. Uh, so I thought that would be nice to add today. But hopefully, you'll see throughout this that uh, Genius really excels in the visualization of the data. Okay. And uh, we even have a number of uh, very savvy bioinformaticians uh, that use Genius because uh, the data visualization uh, is, is, is quite nice. Okay. So if you have any questions, uh, I'm, I'm happy to take questions at the end. Um, as Jason mentioned, I'm, I'm specifically uh, focusing on uh, version 7, uh, which is what you all are on uh, today. So let's get started. Uh, I usually begin with a tour of the interface. Uh, again, I'm not certain who's in the audience, so it's always nice for people who have never seen Genius. Uh, when you go and install Genius on your machine, this is what you see. Okay, You have your local database to the left, and this is where all of your local files are stored. Uh, now those local files you can rename, you can color, you can uh, really organize the way that uh, you or your group uh, works. Okay. Just underneath that is a list of live services. And remember, I'd mentioned that there, there are many who uh, go to uh, publicly available websites uh, to pull down sequence data. Well, instead of opening up a web browser, you can get those data uh, within the live services uh, portion of Genius. And the great thing about this is that uh, when you download sequence data, you are also downloading all of the metadata associated with those sequences. For instance, if you uh, query NCBI for uh, a, a gene list uh, or for a genome, uh, so you do get the sequence data, uh, which is fantastic, but um, Genius actually crawls um, throughout NCBI uh, to pull down and to annotate the metadata onto your sequence data. So when you click on a folder, the document table opens up, and the document table, of course, shows you the contents of the folder, and we see we've got a number of different headers over the top. Uh, we've got a name, uh, the number of nucleotides, uh, number of sequences. Uh, these headers can be moved around. Uh, we have even more headers that have not been shown. 
Okay. Uh, when you uh, click on this document, the document viewer opens up. And uh, this, I think, is one of the most uh, uh, compelling features of, of Genius because now you can actually see your data. And we see just above the document viewer, we've got a mini map. So you've got some type of context uh, for where you are on your sequence. Okay. So if you're working with a very long chromosome, uh, you've got kind of a nice overarching view of where you're at. And we see we have a number of annotation features uh, mapped onto the sequence data. And those are managed over here in the options panel. And it's not just annotations that are managed, but uh, coloring sequences, uh, reading frame. Um, you can uh, generate a number of different plots and graphs using this options panel. And then over here to the right is the help and tutorial panel. Uh, and the help and tutorial panel is meant for people who are starting with Genius and they want to get up and running. Um, perhaps you want to meet as a lab group and you want to learn how to um, uh, build primers on a multiple sequence alignment. Okay, we, we have those type of tutorials here. And uh, if, if you're a, a, a facile user with Genius, uh, you can shrink that panel down so you can increase your screen real estate. So you can, you can open it or close it uh, as you see fit. And then at the very top is the menu bar. And the menu bar, you'll see a collection of icons uh, for starting processes. So if you'd like to perform a sequence search or if you'd like to uh, do um, uh, PCR cloning, uh, we've got those icons up there shown now. Uh, there are even more that are not shown. So you can really customize the menu bar. Uh, there are two buttons at the menu bar that I always like to call out. And the first one is the backup button shown there to the right. That green backup button is something that I encourage every biologist to get in the habit of using because you don't appreciate your data until your data are gone. Okay, so please, please, please uh, get on a regular backup schedule. Uh, and then not shown there, but if you uh, clicked on the two arrows pointing to the right, there's a support button. Uh, that support button, you can uh, submit a question, uh, you can uh, make a feature recommendation, uh, and by doing that, uh, that really helps us stay in touch with our user base. So if you're having a hard time doing something, um, you can either email me, and I'll give you the email address at the end of this, or you can um, ask our support team. And our support desk uh, we have in New Zealand. Uh, so from, uh, from Harvard, I think they're plus uh, 13 hours ahead uh, in the future. So oftentimes, I'll, I'll be CC'd in on those support issues so I can answer a little bit more timely. But use that support button, okay? because that's something that I, a lot of our users, I think, really benefit from. Well, let's get started. Uh, so you need uh, sequences, and uh, within Genius, you can uh, access publicly available databases, uh, as I would mentioned. So uh, we are focusing on cloning today, but oftentimes uh, people really need to uh, go out and, and find a sequence uh, of interest, uh, whether it's mouse or human, uh, it doesn't really matter. Uh, in this case, uh, I've got a mouse sequence uh, that I'm going to perform a sequence search with, and I'm showing you here the uh, uh, within the document viewer, uh, what that mouse sequence looks like. Uh, we've got uh, gene annotation, we've got um, CVS uh, annotation. Uh, to perform a sequence search, you would select on that document, you would click on the sequence search uh, button at the top of the menu bar, and Genius will prompt you with a dialog box. Uh, and you're going to have to make some choices here. Now, regardless of what you're doing in Genius, you will always see this type of a dialog box pop up. So whether you're uh, doing a Gibson assembly or uh, whether you're doing uh, NGS, uh, this, this dialog box will open up. Okay. So Genius infers that the sequence that you selected is the one that you'd like to perform a sequence search with. Uh, but if you have unformatted FASTA sequence, you can select that and, and paste sequence in. Uh, you have some choices that you need to make, such as uh, the database that you'd like to use. So here we're going to uh, select the NR database at GenBank, uh, as well as the program that we're going to use. We're going to be using BLASTN. And uh, uh, once you have selected the parameters that you have, uh, whether it's um, uh, if you'd like to turn on the low complexity filter or uh, repeats filter, uh, you can do that. You can also tell Genius uh, how many results or how many hits you would like to return. Okay, so here I'm, I've got shown 100 uh, maximum hits that will be returned. Now, when I click on the search button, 
a new folder is created underneath that uh, nucleotide documents folder over there to the left in my local directory. Okay, and you see there's a little uh, magnifying glass uh, that is put on there uh, to show you that a search was performed. Okay, so we try to give lots of little visual cues. After you've been staring at your screen for 16 hours, you need all the help you can get. So, so here we've got a new folder that's been generated. We have search results, uh, which is uh, shown here in this hit table view. Uh, and they're sorted uh, by E value. Okay. If I click on the top hit, I see that uh, the first query result is shown here in the document viewer, uh, as well as um, the sequence that I performed the search with. Okay. I can zoom in uh, to look and see the agreements and disagreements for nucleotides. I can select a number of sequences from that hit table and show them within the document viewer. I can even turn on the find open reading frames um, by selecting the find open reading frames box to the right in the options panel. So Genius shows that we found 78 new open reading frames. I can turn on the translation button. And uh, when I do that, uh, I, I can tell Genius that I would like to translate in any given frame, whether it's frames one and three forward or frames two and three reverse or all frames, uh, it's up to you. And we also, I would point out, have the genetic code that you would need to designate if you're working with bacterial sequence or mitochondrial. Um, but when you return this list of um, BLAST results back, you got the results, but you didn't get the sequence data. And you can tell this because uh, the little icon just to the left of the names of the sequences that I have highlighted. So the two, four, sixth column over to the right you see those icons are a bit faded, and that's to tell you, well, you need to download your sequence. And so by clicking on the download full sequence button, you'll have your sequences download, and those sequences will be emboldened. Okay? And then we'll also have a number of annotations that are now available, including uh, the blast hit. Okay? So by moving over to the query-centric view, you can look at uh, things like coverage. Uh, so you can look and see where each of these results uh, lines up with your initial uh, query sequence. Okay? And then you can also tell Genius how you would like to generate the consensus sequence. So you've got a number of different thresholds that you can use um, by using that drop-down box. Um, right now we're calculating the consensus with 100% uh, identity, but you can relax those certainly if you like. Now, one of the powerful things about Genius, uh, which I'll show you and I'll, I'll take you through um, uh, a bit of the, the risky live demo, is that you uh, are able to really manage your annotations in a very smooth and, and efficient fashion. Okay? So when you did a sequence search, uh, we have annotations uh, on our original sequence, uh, but we can also transfer those annotations. Okay? So we can transfer the annotations from the BLAST results over to our query sequence. And you can tell Genius the threshold for similarity with which you'd like to transfer those annotations. So if you'd like to relax the similarity threshold and include annotations from 90% and above, uh, you can do that. Or you can relax it all the way down to 43%. Uh, you can designate the cost matrix uh, for uh, the transfer. Okay? And you can even transfer your annotations over to your consensus sequence. And this is, this is a, a very fluid way uh, to work with annotation data. Uh, and so here you see that the annotations are a bit faded. And again, that's because they've not been permanently saved to the consensus. And when you hit the apply button to the right, then those annotations will, will be permanently uh, affixed to the consensus, All right? So if you move over to the distances view, uh, this is just another lens for your data. Uh, so we have um, uh, a matrix uh, shown for the percent pairwise identity, okay? And so, uh, you can also dictate whether or not you'd like to generate a heat map from this, too. <clears throat> so you can look and see how your sequences cluster. Uh, I'll go through multiple sequence alignments uh, just very quickly. Um, I think everybody in the room is probably um, fairly familiar with these, but uh, in order to align your sequence data, uh, you would take a group set of sequences uh, selected there in the document table. Uh, click on the uh, Align and Assemble button at the top of the menu bar and pull down to Multiple Alignment. You have a number of alignment options uh, that you'd like to, uh, or that you can utilize. Uh, so we have Genius, uh, which is just um, a variation of the Smith-Waterman method. Uh, we also have Muscle, uh, including all of the parameters that Muscle normally uh, offers out in the wild. 
we've included Clust LW, and we've also included MAFT. Okay, uh, MAFT is fantastic if you are aligning a large number of sequence data, um, 250,000 sequences. Uh, MAFT is perfect. <coughs> Wherever possible, if we've used a, if we've used a method uh, which we have all throughout Genius, uh, we link out to the original paper that that method uh, was first published. Okay, so if you've never seen MAFT, you can click on the link there for the nu Nucleic Acids Journal, and it'll take you straight to uh, Kato's paper uh, back in 2002 when MAFT was first released. We have a number of different heuristics for MAFT. Um, we have an auto-select feature, which um, certainly you can take advantage of if you like. We also have a translation alignment option. And this is an option that many um, don't necessarily take advantage of in Genius, where you can uh, align on the uh, amino acids in the background, and you can reveal um, the nucleic acids in the foreground. Okay, so you can look at issues of, of frame uh, within the alignment. <coughs> Excuse me. So once you've done your alignment, you get some sequence alignment, whatever method you used. Something to call out is whenever you uh, perform um, an operation on your sequence data, oftentimes a new document is created. Okay, so we took all of those uh, macaca sequences, we aligned them. Now we've got a new alignment document called nucleotide alignment, and the description says it's the alignment of 16 sequences. Now within the viewer, it's interactive. You can select and you can zoom in uh, to examine uh, your sequence data. You can even tell Genius that you'd like to color uh, by codon uh, or by reading frame. So I'd really encourage you to explore that options panel. Uh, there's a lot of power there within that panel uh, to look at your sequence data. You can highlight only the disagreements. Okay, so if you're looking at a number of sequences, um, you know, 96 sequences uh, that you um, are running a trial on, uh, you can look and see those sequences uh, that have just the disagreements. And if your eyes are getting tired, uh, like mine do, uh, you can turn everything that matches into dots. And so now you're looking just at the disagreements. You can also calculate the way that that uh, consensus uh, identity is, uh, is generated just at the top. Okay, so in this case, we have 100% identity, uh, but you can relax that too if you like. Um, oftentimes, the sequence that is used in uh, your reference sequence is buried within your multiple sequence alignment. Uh, and if that's the case, you can right click on that reference and a shortcut window will pop up. So you can uh, set that as uh, set as reference. And when you do that, uh, all of the other sequences will now be compared to that and will be highlighted in yellow. Uh, and you can drag and drop that to the top. Okay. So very easy um, uh, to use Genius for multiple sequence alignment. We'll move into um, some new alignment tools that are in version seven uh, that I think you all uh, may be uh, uh, interested to know about. And I'll just go through these uh, quickly again. Uh, last Z. Um, last Z is a whole genome alignment uh, method. Uh, and we've placed that underneath uh, Align Whole Genomes, uh, underneath the Align and Assemble button at the top. And it's a BLAST-like um, uh, alignment tool that you can use. And we've included Bowtie 2, uh, which has been placed underneath uh, our mapper menu list uh, for map to reference. Okay. So a number of our folks uh, who, are, who use Genius have, are coming over from using other software for their Sanger sequencing, for their cloning operations, uh, Sequencer, Laser Gene, uh, Vector and TI. Uh, a lot of these uh, software packages were fantastic when they were out, but uh, we've, I, I believe we've improved on a lot of their methods. And, and uh, if you're doing Sanger sequencing, uh, it's very easy to handle those data. So you can drag and drop your AB1 files into Genius. And here I've got uh, two uh, reads, uh, forward read and uh, reverse read. Uh, but Genius will handle a million reads, or however many reads uh, you, you have that you're working with. Uh, the point is, Genius is agnostic uh, in terms of uh, the sequencing uh, platform that you've generated your sequence data from. Okay. So here I've got two reads colored according to quality score. We see in the, in the document visualizer, we've got the chromatogram uh, that's shown here. Uh, and so we can quickly see that you know, the five prime uh, ends of both of these reads are, are pretty, uh, pretty much garbage. So we have uh, operations within Genius where you can trim these sequences uh, either automatically uh, or you can do it manually if you like. 
Uh, if you're working with lots of data, um, you'll want to use the automatic feature, of course. But to trim these sequences, um, what we're going to do is uh, we're going to start the de novo assembly first, um, which sounds kind of odd. But when we do that, uh, over there to the bottom left of this de novo assembly dialog box, you'll see that we've got the trimming options there. Okay, So you can click on the options button to trim your sequences. And Genius will ask you how you would like to trim these sequences. Would you like to annotate the new trimmed regions, uh, which is what we call a soft trim? And what we do is uh, Genius will, will go through and will annotate those regions according to your quality threshold. Uh, and we'll place an annotation there. And we'll not necessarily get rid of those nucleotides, uh, but those nucleotides will be ignored for downstream analyses. Or you can choose to remove the new trimmed regions permanently. Okay. Uh, now here is where uh, a number of our users, I think, would be uh, pleased to find out that you can trim vector sequence off of these reads by selecting the trim vectors and reusing uh, Univec for this. Uh, you can also trim primer sequence off of this, uh, or off of these uh, uh, Sanger reads. You can set your error probability limit uh, for how you would like to uh, trim, as well as uh, trimming the five prime or the three prime ends. Okay. And so when you select those and you've uh, set your parameters and click on the OK button, now you'll have to choose what type of assembler you'd like to use, uh, the sensitivity settings you would like to use. And then at the bottom right, you would choose that you would like to save the results in um, its own folder. When you click on the OK button, a new folder is generated with your results that are within the folder. Uh, two files are made. Uh, the first one is the assembler report. And this assembler report tells you exactly what happened. Okay, so this is just a sample use case. All two reads were assembled to produce a contig. And those links are active. So if you click on the link, it'll take you to the contig. And we've got a number of uh, bits and pieces of technical information underneath there as well. Okay. When you click on the contig button, uh, or the contact document, uh, then you can look and see uh, how these reads were assembled. And so Genius always shows you the most global view of uh, the reads that have been assembled. So we see we have a reverse read, we have a forward read there in the document viewer. Uh, we see we've got a coverage plot. And at the five prime and the three prime ends of these reads, we see those little pink boxes, and those are the soft uh, trim or the uh, soft annotation uh, that we selected prior. I can uh, click on the go to next disagreement button in the options panel, or I can click on uh, command or control D, and that'll highlight the first disagreement uh, between these two reads. And I can zoom into that disagreement. Uh, so when I zoom in, I can see there's a base that's called, uh, there's an A that's called, and then there's um, nothing that's called in the reverse read. And by clicking on the allow editing button at the top, I can uh, choose to uh, type in an A in order to correct that reverse read. And Genius will flag that correction with that neon green box that's placed just above the A. Okay. And then when I, when I choose the Save button, that, um, that change that I made will be permanently saved. So I can come back and I can examine all of the things uh, that have happened or that have changed um, within the sequence data. This is a fantastic feature if you have many hands on a project. Uh, or many hands on uh, sequence files. And you can trace back to see uh, who did what when. Uh, maybe there was a more appropriate method to be used uh, for something that you can go back and, um, and you can choose to do uh, or redo. So Genius uh, manages Sang Sanger data uh, quite well. Um, Sanger data is quite relevant uh, for the molecular cloning topic, which is what we're talking about today. Uh, we have a number of great features within version seven. Um, arguably, I think it's, the, it's, it's been the largest jump that we've had in version release uh, because we've added uh, methods that a lot of the synthetic biology community is using. Uh, we've added Gibson, uh, we've added Topo, uh, we've added Talon assembly. Um, gateway cloning is now one step, uh, multi-site gateway cloning. Uh, PCR cloning uh, we have, of course, uh, with parent descendant tracking. Um, and I'll make no bones about it, the, the parent descendant tracking we, we took from Vector and TI it was a fantastic idea. <clears throat> and I'll show you why uh, if you're not familiar with it. So to 
um, in, in this use case, I'll show you uh, just a sample workflow for how to uh, perform uh, cloning. Uh, within this vector, I've got the PEF vector uh, shown here. And then I've got a human pro-insulin gene that I would like to insert into the vector. <coughs> the first step is I need to search for restriction site or restriction enzymes that will cut at the sites of interest. Uh, and so in this case, I'd like to uh, perform my cloning just upstream of this GFP reporter gene. And so on the vector, I'm going to select that region. Over there to the right in the options panel, I'm going to select find restriction sites. And I'm going to make sure that uh, the uh, interval is uh, proper. Uh, so it's 1344 to 1436. Uh, if those numbers have, have not been changed, that uh, small button to the right is the refresh button. So sometimes there's a little bit of a lag there. But when you click on the refresh button, Genius will find, oh, well, there's one NCO1 uh, restriction enzyme that will cut at that site that I designated. But Genius actually found 52 uh, enzymes, but this is the only one that's shown for that region that I selected. So when I click on the apply button, that restriction enzyme will be permanently annotated onto my vector. Okay, so if you close Genius down and walk away, and grab a cup of coffee and you come back, that restriction site will still be there. Okay, so if you've done any annotation uh, and you attempt to close Genius down, Genius will always prompt you to save it if you've not done that. Okay, so we've tried to build in a, a little bit of a safety measure there for you. So the next step is we uh, would want to zoom in and we want to see, okay, this is where the NCO1 enzyme is going to cut. And we've got uh, a small uh, downward arrow indicating uh, the cut site. If we move over to our human pro-insulin gene, uh, we need to also uh, find the restriction uh, cut site uh, for the same NCO1 enzyme. Okay. So uh, we would choose that from our enzyme list uh, over there to the right of the options panel. Uh, if you click on the commonly used uh, enzyme underneath the candidate enzymes, uh, you would choose the NCO1 from the list. Now, one nice thing, one feature that we did um, uh, quite well, I think, uh, for restriction enzymes is now you can create your own custom lists. So you don't have to get stuck with these pre-populated lists because you know not all of these you're going to find in your freezer. So build a list of the inventory that is reflected in your freezer. And you can, um, you can search on this list much in the same way you can with your primers. Okay, so this is a, a nice addition that we've added. So with the NCO1 enzyme, uh, we see that that's been annotated uh, just five prime of the pro-insulin CDS. Okay. And we've also uh, clicked on the save button so that it's permanently uh, saved there. And the next thing we need to do is we need to uh, design our primers. So if you click on the translation button, that'll translate all of the sequence Okay, um, the sequence that we're interested in for the pro-insulin CDS. Uh, this is important because when we design our primers, we don't care about the stop codon at the three prime end. So to design our primers, you're going to select everything within the document viewer from three prime all the way to five prime, just in front of the NCO1 enzyme. And then go up to the top to your primers button and you're going to pull down to design new primers. And you'll see we've also got other features in there, uh, which we'll talk a little bit about. Um, when you design new primers, a primer dialog box will open up. Uh, we use Primer 3 as our backend in order to um, uh, design primers. You can designate uh, a number of different um, settings uh, within here uh, that you could outside of Genius. Um, forward primer, uh, reverse primer, you could do primer pair, which is what we'll be doing here. Uh, make sure that the included region is set, um, that the product size is consistent, so 332. Uh, if you're creating primers on multiple sequence alignments, uh, you can allow for degeneracies, uh, as well as you can set TM min max, a percent GC min max, uh, all of those things that you would need to use to design your primers. So when you click on the OK button, uh, the primers are designed and they are mapped onto your human pro-insulin CDS that you want to clone into your vector. And we see that the primers uh, have some directional information. Um, you know, one is pointing to the right, one is pointing to the left. Uh, they're labeled, first forward, first reverse. Um, so they've also been added into our annotations menu over there to the right. 
Okay, so we've got a primer binding reverse and then just regular primer bind. So if you double click or right click, um, you can extract these primers um, and you can give them a, a relevant name. So in this case, it's just gonna be really easy, human pro-insulin primer. Um, and we see if I select the primers that they've now been given a small icon just to the left of the name. Uh, those green directional arrows indicate that Genius considers these primers. So no matter where your primers are saved in your local directory, you can choose to test with those safe primers if you like. And I'll show you how to do that. Uh, but now what we need to do is we need to add a five prime extension. So you can either uh, double click on the primer um, or you can uh, do the long way uh, and go up to um, the primers uh, menu bar at the top and pull down to add five prime extension. But if you um, add five prime extension, you can choose the extension type uh, that you'd like to uh, utilize. So we're going to add a restriction site uh, extension type. Um, we're, of course, going to be choosing the NCO1 enzyme. The primer uh, expands uh, with that green fluorescent box to show that we've uh, made an extension. Uh, and we can also even add nucleotides if we like. So if we'd like to uh, insert a nucleotide to help improve cutting, uh, if we want to add a number of uh, Gs in this case, um, you can do that by choosing the Allow Editing button at the top and just writing in uh, the nucleotides that you would like to uh, in, uh, include. So this Test with Save Primers feature uh, that I alluded to uh, is fantastic. If you have a number of primers uh, that you have imported into Genius uh, or that you've been using uh, within your laboratory, uh, to pull down or to use uh, the Test with Save Primers feature, go up to the Primers icon at the top, pull down to Test with Save Primers, and you'll see the two Choose buttons um, up there right next to the Forward Primer and the Reverse Primer. Okay. When you click on those Choose buttons, this is where you can choose which primers you would like to test with. Okay. And you can sort uh, or decide which primers you would like to test with. So uh, primers that only have a TM value of X or um, primers that have a hairpin value of Y. Okay. So uh, the point is, this is a very easy uh, and quick way um, to identify a number of different primers that you'd like to test with. So in this case, we only have two, okay? So uh, we're going to use these two primers, uh, click on the OK button, and Genius will now map these primers uh, back onto our ProInsulin CDS, okay? And you see uh, in the tooltip, if you float your mouse over the primer, that the extension is shown there, uh, as well as uh, a number of different values, uh, percent GC, uh, TM value. Um, this tooltip, you can copy all of that text that's in there and you can paste it into uh, an electronic laboratory notebook if you like. Um, so these tooltips are meant to, uh, to be interactive. Okay. So now we're ready to extract our PCR product. Uh, and to do this, go to the primers button at the top again, pull down to extract PCR product, Genius is going to go through a couple checks to make sure uh, that the extraction is taking place uh, the way that uh, you're intending it to. So the two primers, we're extracting one product, uh, product length of 341, including the extension that we added. Click on the OK button, and now we've got our product, including that five prime extension shown there at the very bottom, the three prime end. Okay. So now we've got our NCO1 sites at the five prime, three prime ends, and now we're ready to insert this into our vector. So you would select this product, and then you would select the vector that you would like to perform the insertion into. Okay, and then you're gonna pull down to insert into vector. Um, Genius will again go through um, a bit of quality control. Um, the, so the way these restriction sites cut, um, it's a palindromic cut. So the insert can go in either way. So you have to tell Genius how you would like to perform that. So we have a little lo-fi uh, method at the very bottom there for product. Uh, so you see exactly how the insertion is going to happen. When you click on the OK button, the product has been inserted into the vector at that NCO1 site. And it's about that four o'clock um, uh, region uh, that we designated earlier. Uh, we also see that in our annotations and tracks section in the options panel, we've got a number of different entities such as We've got two ligation annotations. We've got an inserted sequence. We've got an insertion. We've got some primer binding um, annotations that have been included. 
you can zoom in uh, to the sequence uh, to make sure that the insertion happened uh, the way that you wanted it to happen. Uh, this is where if you've got frame shifts, uh, you can catch it. Uh, we see that the ligation site is annotated there in that really bright fluorescent green. Uh, you can choose to show base numbers uh, and you can tell Genius where you would like the annotations to fall. So if you want to print a figure or a poster, uh, you can really um, dress up your, your figure quite nicely uh, in using the advanced uh, tab to the right. So you can translate uh, the selected region, uh, the little over 1,000 bases, uh, using a particular genetic code, so in this case, standard. Uh, first frame, of course. Um, there are a number of different plots uh, and graphs that you can uh, utilize, such as amino acid charge, uh, hydrophobicity plot. Uh, you can export those if you like. Now, I mentioned the parent-descendant relationship tracking. Uh, this, is, this is key because cloning is uh, very process intensive. You have lots of different steps that you went through in order to come up with your finished um, uh, piece uh, cloned into your vector. And so here what I'm showing you is the parent descendant relationship tracking. Okay, and so this is underneath the lineage tab. So before we were in the sequence view, if you go all the way over to the right, you can select the lineage view. Uh, and again, this is great because we've got an inventory for what time these processes happened. So here I'm showing you the final product, the human proinsulin uh, inserted into the PEF vector. Okay, and then I've got a bunch of other things that happened um, before that, that cascade down. If I click on the human proinsulin at the very bottom, if I double click on that, then I can see, well, that's what I first started with before I started um, uh, finding NCO1 sites, uh, designing primers, uh, adding extensions. Okay. If I click in the middle, I see that I've got some things upstream and I have some things downstream. Now, why is this important? Well, this is important because say I want to make a change. So if there's a frame shift that I would like to correct for, or uh, if I would like to um, uh, change a nucleotide for some reason, uh, then I can go to my original sequence that I started with, that human proinsulin, and I can change uh, a G. Um, and if I want to change the G into a T or a C, uh, Genius will send up an alert. And the alert states that you have a number of things that depend on this original sequence. How would you like to handle that? Well, would you like to propagate the change? Uh, would you like to deactivate the link to the descendants so that they're not updated? Uh, or would you like to save as a copy without the descendants? Okay, so this is a great way for uh, method development. Uh, this is uh, wonderful for um, correcting uh, frame shifts without having to go through um, each and everything that you did. You can propagate that all the way through your process. So when you click on the Save button, the uh, genius will tell you exactly where in the process you're going to make that change. And we'll add yet more annotations. So we see that we changed those G's to T's, uh, so we changed three of them. And we see that uh, we've got three orange boxes that have been added, okay? And uh, those added boxes are going to be annotated as replacements, okay? So just a very quick, fast way uh, for quality control um, to make it a bit easier uh, to work with your uh, cloning. I mentioned earlier, we added Gibson assembly. Um, we listened to uh, the, the community uh, for, for cloning uh, techniques and Gibson was very high on the list. Uh, keep your eyes peeled for CRISPR, uh, which will be coming out uh, next week. Uh, and we've also, we're, we've been working on um, uh, Gateway. Um, so, uh, so you may wanna uh, look at that too. Uh, so for Gibson though, uh, Gibson we've placed underneath the cloning menu. And this is where we are, are including all of our cloning options. So. Um, I don't have CRISPR shown here yet um, because it's not uh, fully ready, uh, but it'll be ready for next week. So for Gibson assembly, um, you will select the pieces that you would like to ligate together. Pull down to Gibson. Uh, Genius will ask you uh, how you would like to perform the assembly. Uh, if there are any vectors, uh, in this case, none, we're just going to ligate these two pieces together. Uh, we're gonna assemble the, the fragments end to end. Uh, this is an interactive window, so you can drag and drop. You can move the pieces around. Uh, you can create a sequence list. So if you have you know, 30 promoters uh, that you would like to perform a series of uh, ligations with, you can do that here. 
set your uh, parameters for overlap length, uh, overlap TM. Now, when you click on the OK button, again, we're, we're, we're large on reporting. Um, so we want you to know what you did, uh, because when you do so many different things throughout the day, it's nice to have an inventory. So this Gibson report is generated. Uh, the Gibson report shows you um, how the assemblies took place. So it shows you the, um, uh, that the, the product is the TET-R repressible uh, GFP generator has been ligated to the YAD FCDS. So if you clicked on that link, it'll take you to that product. Okay. It also, uh, just to the right, you see the first insert. Uh, you see the second insert. Uh, the primers have been generated, uh, as well as the, um, the, the flanking sequences. Uh, and then we've got some other uh, information there uh, just to the right uh, for TM and GC content. Now, the other file that was generated with this ligation, so we've got the report file. If you click on the actual um, file that was uh, the, the two sequences were ligated together, uh, we see that the TET are repressible uh, GFP generator uh, with the ADF CDS is shown here. And we also have a number of new annotations. Uh, so we've got um, uh, the, a number of new annotations shown for uh, the forward and the reverse directions uh, for the ligation sites. So a very uh, quick and easy way uh, to perform Gibson assembly. Uh, we included topo cloning, so in Vitrogen's method uh, for, for cloning, uh, we've included all of the topo vectors. Um, the topo cloning, uh, the, the process runs much the same. And so we have uh, a sequence we, we would like to uh, insert into our topo vector. Uh, our topo vector is uh, shown here, uh, as well as you know, the topo site uh, that you're going to be cloning into uh, at about the one o'clock region. Okay. And again, you would select both of your pieces, uh, your vector, your sequence, pull down to topo cloning. Uh, Genius will ask you um, how you would like to perform this again, uh, whether it's TA cloning or, or blunt cloning. Um, you can save uh, this uh, in its own subfolder if you like, okay? so that as you're performing a number of different topo operations, you can keep them nice and tidy in, in your own respective folders. So click on the OK button and a new product is made. Um, and the description is the concatenation of the two sequences. So the uh, YAD F was inserted at the topo site. And by zooming in, uh, you can see exactly where the piece uh, was inserted. Uh, it was also annotated as an inserted sequence. And uh, you can see the topo site is shown there just about the 12 o'clock region. Now, because cloning is so very process intensive, uh, we have a number of our users, uh, both academic uh, and commercial, who are doing high throughput cloning. Uh, they're doing lots and lots and lots of cloning. Uh, so we did something uh, to hopefully aid this, and this is the workflow builder uh, that is included in R7. Uh, if you've not seen the workflow builder, uh, you may, you may want to pay attention to this. Um, the little blue man at the very top that looks like he's running fast, uh, click on that. And you'll see we've got a number of workflows that are stock workflows that we built. Um, which I'm trying to get more uh, biologists thinking about workflows. Uh, if you click on the manage workflows, uh, you can look and see our, our interface to, to manage these workflows, to import or export or move them around or to build a new one uh, is shown here. And the point is that if you have a cloning process that is taking a number of different steps, uh, you know, 12, 15, 20 different steps. Uh, you want to design that workflow once. You don't want to have to keep coming back to click buttons and, and, and make decisions and link things together. Uh, that's a very inefficient way to work. Uh, an efficient way to work is design your workflow, okay, and save that workflow. Uh, our workflow builder looks like this. Uh, we have, uh, you would give your workflow a name, uh, you would give it a description. Uh, and then we have a number of different steps within this workflow. So for each step, do this underneath these parameters. Okay, and you can drag and drop these steps around. Uh, you can refine uh, the, um, the options uh, that you have for each step. Okay, well, we have a number of operations that you can use uh, to build your workflow. Uh, these operations are directly dependent upon which plugins you've got installed into Genius. Uh, we have lots of different plugins, so 
uh, you're not going to be able to uh, run um, uh, a MAFT uh, operation within the workflow builder if you don't have MAFT plugin installed. Okay, it sounds simple, but it's really easy to forget. Uh, so we have um, grouping functions, saving functions. Uh, if you know Java, you can even write your own Java code uh, into this workflow. Um, this workflow builder is fantastic if you're going to publish because uh, now with your paper, you can publish your supplementary data. You can publish your workflow. So users can download your workflow and drag it and drop it into Genius, and they can repeat exactly what you did uh, for your paper. If you need any help with workflows, uh, of course, I'm available to help. Our support team is available to help. Uh, we've got uh, workflow editing help. Uh, so you just click on the question mark, and it'll hopefully be enough to get you started. So latest features and beyond, I'll just talk briefly about. Um, R8 is coming out uh, next month. Uh, we've got a number of new things uh, that we've added. Uh, CRISPR is probably one of the most exciting. Um, Golden Gate is something that we're really working hard on. Uh, it's not ready yet, but it's something we're working toward. Uh, we're pushing into uh, metagenomics space. Uh, so we've got some uh, functionality for metagenomics uh, 16S. Um, we uh, added the Mira assembler. Uh, we, uh, we, we did a number of, of new features that I think you might, uh, might be interested in. So uh, check us out if you haven't done that yet. Uh, if you'd like more information, please don't hesitate to reach out to me uh, or go to our website. Uh, most of you already have Genius, uh, so you don't need to download it. But you can go to our support forum. Um, our community is quite robust. Uh, we've got a knowledge bank uh, for many, many years of questions. Uh, so uh, I would encourage you to join our community. Uh, let us know your thoughts on Genius. If you've got any requests, um, you know, please he don't hesitate to let us know what you would like to see in Genius. Uh, you can find tutorials here on our website. You can even contact support uh, if you want. Um, our knowledge bank uh, looks like a typical user forum. Uh, so uh, just you can perform a free text search, uh, or you can look around for you know, commonly asked or commonly dealt with issues. Okay. Uh, if you have any questions, please use my email address, uh, christian at biomatters.com. Uh, of course, you know, our support email is always available. Uh, we are at conferences all over the place, so um, please look us up and stop by. Uh, let us know how you're getting on with Genius, uh, how you're not getting on with Genius. If you're having some struggles with it, I really want to hear those uh, so that I can take that information and give it to our developers uh, so we can, we can continue to improve it. Uh, so if you do uh, use Genius, uh, please remember to cite us when you publish. And uh, uh, we're, I'm also up for collaboration. So as application scientists, I help on a lot of projects. Uh, if uh, you're looking for uh, somebody to uh, help out a little bit, uh, please send me a note and we'll see if, uh, uh, if it's a good fit and if I, if I can help you out. So thank you very much for your time. Uh, it's uh, just about an hour now. Uh, I'm happy to take questions. Um, so uh, just please let me know. Great. Uh, thanks, Christian. I had uh, uh, two questions. One, could you talk a little bit about um, uh, resource requirements for uh, Genius, uh, particularly in regards to memory or uh, and even CPU? Yeah, yeah, that's that's a great question. So, you know, bioinformatics can be, um, well, it is uh, oftentimes very dependent upon your hardware. Um, so depending on what you want to do, if you have, uh, if you want to do uh, next generation sequence assembly uh, or large alignments or you're building a large tree, uh, phylogenetic tree, um, I recommend no more than half of the total amount of RAM that's on your machine. So if you have 16 GBs on your MacBook Pro, allocate 8,000. Uh, and this is because Genius uh, needs you know, a, a decent amount of RAM uh, to do some of these things. But oftentimes, Genius will launch processes outside of Genius. And so you're going to need some resource to handle those methods. So no more than half um, I would allocate. Uh, and I can, I can show people if they're interested uh, how to set that. But by default, only one GB is set um, for the installation of Genius. So um, definitely, if you're doing NGS or larger multiple sequence alignments, uh, you're, you're going to want to up the RAM uh, quite a bit. And so on a, on a related note, I was wondering, so a lot of people, when they go to sort of larger scale uh, NGS or genomics uh, bioinformatics, uh, they move to an HPC environment, like a cluster or something where they have 
access to you know, nodes with lots of RAM and lots of cores. Is there any uh, support for that ingenious or plans to go in that way? Because I think that this annotation framework around it to like build workflows would be particularly awesome on those sorts of environments where it's hard to keep track of like yeah. that sort of information. Yeah, absolutely. So, so we have something uh, currently right now, which is um, a completely separate animal from the Genius client. It's called Genius Server. And Genius Server acts as middleware so that um, clients can dish their jobs uh, through Genius Server onto your Rocks cluster or, or Blade server. Uh, you can queue jobs. Uh, you can close down your, your client and, and come back and open it up to find out if the job is completed. So we have that already, uh, which is, again, um, completely different from the local installation of Genius. Uh, we are starting to have discussions about taking advantage of uh, cloud resources. So keep your eyes peeled uh, for that because uh, a number of our users who are looking for scalability, um, they want to fire up an AWS uh, account and they want to run their job on Amazon. Um, that is something that we are um, very keenly interested in. Uh, we don't have any offering yet, but um, I, would, I would say keep your eyes peeled. Yeah. <clears throat> that sounds fantastic. Yeah, yeah. That, that would be really great. All right, uh, with that, I think uh, we'll wrap it up. Thanks again, Christian. Uh, really yeah. appreciate it and uh, very useful. Thank you very of much. Of course. Thanks so much, Jason. Cheers. Bye.